Uh, OK, so uh, before I can get to what quantum field theory is, I need to spend a bit of time explaining the background. So let's start off with classical field theory. So uh, why should we care about this? Well, I'll, gi I'll give you two reasons. One is that uh, it, it, it's necessary to understand classical field theory in order to promote it to a quantum field theory. A lot of the in classical ingredients play an important role. So need for QFT. And it's also just a good idea to, before you study a quantum theory, you should understand the classical limit to get a lot of intuition. Uh, but secondly, it works. Uh, you may have used electromagnetism in your intro electromagnetism courses, for example, um, or, or uh, more generally classical physics. It works rather well. And this gives me an excuse to introduce an idea that I'll need throughout this talk, which is effective field theory, which is uh, why classical physics works. So uh, the, the idea is very simple. Uh, if I want to tell you how a football will, the, the trajectory of, of a football, I don't need to know all of special relativity in order to do that. Uh, and, and, and so th there, there's some set of physics that is relevant at the particular energy scales that you care about. And you can neglect all of the other physics uh, above those energy scales in some self-consistent way. So this is a uh, uh, theory of physics. that gives correct answers as long as you're careful to only ask questions that are within its domain of validity. Answers to low energy questions. Question, all right, I'll just write. Uh, so a sort of cartoon that you should have in mind for effective field theory is if I've got some very complicated hills and landscape uh, and something else. And I have a ball sitting here with very little energy, so it can't possibly escape this hill. Then, you know, I, I don't need to know the details of all of this. I can just focus on the geometry here, and, and I have some nice quadratic potential. So, so this is, in fact, uh, the, the source, for example, of why the harmonic oscillator is, is so important in physics. Is it, it, yeah, it gives the universal description of this low energy physics, but where, where you don't have to worry about all these details. OK, so, uh, so let me start off now with uh, scalar field theory. So in general, a quantum field theory is, uh, is, is, or sorry, a classical field theory, it, it, the, the basic ingredients you need are some fields. So uh, what do the fields live on? They live on some manifold M. I'll call this space time. Uh, I'll explain the reason for the quotations in a second. But I mean, it's because what we call M might not always be what we think of as all of space and time. Uh, and I'll equip this with a Lorentzian metric for now. Uh, G. Lorentzian. So you know the negative signature uh, part corresponds to the time direction, uh, and, and then fields are just maps from M into some target space. And th this is uh, very general. So for example, uh, th 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 this this can account th this can uh, include uh, sections of a tangent bundle, for example. So. So that would be functions from a manifold to you know, the fibers over each point in that manifold. Um, and, and we would call those vector fields. Uh, if y is not a non-trivial bundle over our manifold, it, it's just you know, this is a genuine function, then, then, uh, th then we call this a scalar field. So you know, more generally, we have scalars, we have spinner fields, uh, vectors, tensors, et cetera. Uh, 
Okay, so, so let me start off just with the simplest, uh, simplest field theories. These are scalar field theories. So as an example, let's look at the harmonic oscillator. So this is a particle which feels a linear restoring force, um, which pulls it back to the origin. So, so uh, ma ma mathematically, what do we mean by a, a particle? We mean that it has no spatial extent. So it exists for all of time, but, but you know, it, it has no spatial extent. So this means that M here is just gonna be uh, the real line equipped li with the Lorentzian metric uh, ds squared is minus dt squared. Um, I don't know, if you're not happy with that notation, we have like, um, so, so, you know, this, this is why I put space time in quotes over there is because uh, M is really gonna be the manifold over which our fields uh, are, are allowed to vary. Okay, and, uh, and then our field here is just a function X from uh, the real line parameterized by time to the real line and we think of x of t as giving the position of this particle at some time t on the real line. Okay, so uh, th that's not uh, all I need in order to specify the harmonic oscillator. Um, an unglamorous description of the point of physics is if I give you some state at some time, then I'm supposed to tell you how that state will evolve over time. And in order to do that, I need to provide what's called an action. So uh, from, from the action, we extract the dynamical principles of the theory, the, that is the, the rules that govern time evolution of the theory. Uh, and the way we do that is by extremizing the action. So, you know, delta S, delta X equals zero, and uh, th these give what's called the Euler-Lagrange equations. Uh, okay, so in this particular example of the harmonic oscillator, uh, oh, so in general, you know, by locality, the action will always be the integral of some uh, Lagrangian. So S equals integral over M, you know, your volume form uh, times, uh, yeah, it's the integral of the Lagrangian, where the Lagrangian is some function from M to uh, the real numbers. And importantly, uh, L of X, only depends on the fields and their derivatives at that point x. That, that's what I mean by locality. Okay, so let, let's look at this for the harmonic oscillator. Uh, I No, it, it, it's... It's a function on M. I'm integrating it over M. It, 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 uh, it you know, it, it, it does depend on the fields, though. So, so it is a functional of the fields. That that is true. Yeah, I mean, the the fields depend on on M. So, so in that way, uh, you you get a, a function from M. Okay, so the action of the harmonic oscillator, uh, I'm gonna write it in a sort of obnoxious way just to emphasize that uh, metrics matter in physics. Um, uh, so, you know, in general, physics cares about lengths and, uh, and angles. So here, uh, G inverse is the bilinear form on the cotangent space. Um, and, uh, okay, I can write this in a less obnoxious way as just And if I extremize this uh, action with respect to, to uh, x, then, then I will indeed find the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is uh, And we can recognize this as the um, the as Newton's law f, f equals m a, where here we have some linear restoring force. Okay, so that that's uh, probably the simplest possible quantum field theory. 
or sorry, classical field theory. Uh, so, so now let's upgrade this a bit to higher dimensions. So uh, let, let's now consider m to be uh, r n minus 1 comma n, sorry, comma 1. And uh, our field will again be uh, a, a real scalar field. So by that, I mean x is a map from m to the real numbers. And uh, the Lagrangian of this theory is uh, minus a half d mu phi, sorry, d mu x, d mu x, where here I'm uh, implicitly summing over these mu indices from 0 up to n minus 1 and raising and lowering with the metric. So, so explicitly, this looks like uh, a half dtx squared minus sum over the spatial indices of uh, di phi, dix squared. And uh, uh, so just like in the harmonic oscillator, this takes the form of kinetic energy minus some potential energy. Um, and we sometimes just call the potential energy the potential. Uh, but here, uh, you know, uh, so here the form of the potential energy is some gradient energy rather than, uh, can, ra rather than you know, e explicit uh, x squared, m squared, x squared. Uh, and um, OK, so I can upgrade this theory a little bit uh, by adding such a term to, to the Lagrangian. Uh, so, so let me call this you know, L sub m. Uh, and, and this is the same theory, just with uh, a, an extra term added to the potential. Uh, minus a half m squared x squared. OK, so uh, bo both of these theories are called free field theories. And the reason is just if you compute the Euler-Lagrange equations, you get uh, the, the D'Alembertian, this is the, you know, the Laplacian in Minkowski space, minus m acting on your field equals 0. And th this is a linear equation that you know, hopefully we can all solve in our sleep with separation of variables. Uh, box, yes, yeah, the, it's the Laplacian in uh, Minkowski space. Sorry? Oh, uh, I mean, it's like uh, minus dt squared plus some of our spatial components, d uh, i squared. Here? Uh, yeah, thank you. OK, so I just told you that uh, we could uh, we, we could solve this equation using separation of variables. Uh, let me actually rewrite this action in a sort of strange looking way because it'll prove very useful uh, when we turn to the quantum theory. So, so we're just gonna rewrite this in terms of a Fourier transform, but only in the spatial directions. So, uh, so let me define uh, x of t, this is equal to uh, integral d3k over 2 pi cubed, uh, e to the i kx, and then x of tk. So if we uh, rewrite the action in terms of this Fourier transform, the action uh, will look almost identical to the harmonic oscillator, just we'll have continuously many harmonic oscillators, one for each uh, choice of k. So let me write this out. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, you know, if, if I just focus on one particular value of k, this looks like the exact same action that I had before for the harmonic oscillator. 
uh, where here the frequency of the harmonic oscillator is just k squared. Uh, this is you know magnitude squared of k plus m squared. So uh, for every single point in k space, I, I have a harmonic oscillator, and they're not interacting with each other. You know, I, I can uh, I, I can sol so yeah I can sol solve for each uh, Fourier coefficient independently, and, and that's again just saying what you already know about separation of variables, just in a sort sort slightly different way. Okay, uh, let me generalize this example uh, even further. Uh, so now let's. Uh, Let's consider a target space Y uh, with a Riemannian metric H. And uh, our, our field will be a map X from space time into Y. Uh, so, you know, in, in the examples we've been studying, the, 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 this generalizes the examples we've been studying where Y is either the real line or, uh, or you know, uh, yeah, and real line over here also. Um, so, so more generally, I can write a Lagrangian of this form, uh, minus a half. T is just some positive coefficient. So, you know, in the harmonic oscillator, this is the mass. Uh, and then let me write it like this, G inverse tensor H applied to dx dx. Uh, and here d dx is the um, matrix of partial derivatives uh, of x, so explicitly Explicitly, uh, dx is a map from space-time to cotangent space to space-time, tensor the tangent space to y. So that, that's just the matrix of partial derivatives of x. And uh, yeah, th this, you know, this, this gives me a diffeomorphism invariant Lagrangian. Uh, sorry? T is a positive co coefficient. So, you know, in the harmonic oscillator, it played the role of the mass. Uh, and indeed, uh, this, okay, so let me give this, this theory a name. It's called the nonlinear sigma model for, you know, historical reasons. There are no sigmas. Uh, and and uh, what it, physically, this is describing the dynamics of maps from space time into some target space y. So, uh, you know, if uh, if space-time is one-dimensional, it's just time. This is describing a particle moving around in y. If uh, if if m is two-dimensional, so it's one space and one time dimension, this is describing the dynamics of a string uh, exploring y. And, and more generally, uh, this is describing you know some higher-dimensional version of a membrane uh, pr probing some space y. Um, so let me just say uh, uh, physics. of a uh, uh, dim m dimensional object exploring y. And then you know you can make this even fancier. You can add potential terms like we did for the harmonic oscillator that sort of you know, prefer certain places in Y relative to other places. So they yeah. What is this H, uh, H is a uh, is a Riemannian metric on Y. So okay, let, let me write out this Lagrangian in physics language because it's better. Okay, so if you like the first version, you know, there's no saving you. Um. <laughs> All right, and uh, nonlinear sigma models are very ubiquitous uh, in supersymmetric theories. Why is that? Well, I, I, you know, generally there's no reason that you shouldn't add a potential to your theory. And, and uh, sort of, it, uh, 
in the philosophy of effective field theory, uh, if there's no reason that, that you shouldn't add some term to your Lagrangian, you know, it's not prevented by symmetries, then, then you should probably expect it to be there with some coefficient. Uh, but in, su in supersymmetric theories, you very frequently ha have such strong constraints on your Lagrangian from supersymmetry that you just can't possibly add any potential uh, for your scalars. And, and so, you, so you get the, these nonlinear sigma models at low energies. Uh, and, and a very concrete example that'll show up next week is uh, uh, for, for certain four-dimensional field theories wrapped on a circle, uh, you, the, the, this Y will be the moduli space, uh, the, the Hitchin moduli space. Okay, so let me now turn to gauge theories. So, gauge theories. So the setting here, as we're probably familiar, is uh, principal bundle P over M. Uh, and our field here is a connection on uh, this bundle, is a principal connection on this bundle. Uh, so, okay, I should say P is a principal G bundle for some Lie group G. Uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, we, we can add to this um, certain other fields, which are sections of associated bundles. So let me, let me choose some representation, rho from uh, G to some vector space V. Then I can form an associated vector bundle P times V uh, at uh, rho, which is P times V mod g, where g acts from the right on p and acts via this row on v. Okay, and, and uh, you know, we, we can form a, a field, field a connection, sorry, a curvature, uh, which physicists call field strength uh, fr from, this, from this connection. So we get some f, which is uh, d omega plus this I is uh, probably not going to make you happy, but it's so that my, uh, gate, my, my connection is going to be Hermitian rather than anti-Hermitian. Uh, okay, so once I have this, uh, th this, this curvature, this genuinely transforms in the adjoint representation, and so uh, I, I can form the gauge invariant combination uh, trace F wedge star F. Star is the you know, Hodge star. Uh, and this guy g gives me uh, a gauge invariant Lagrangian for, for uh, Ying Mills theory. So, so let me write that out more explicitly. The Lagrangian for Ying Mills theory is 1 over 2e squared star trace f wedge star f. Um, which again in human language is uh, trace f mu nu, f mu nu. Uh, okay, so so that that's fine mathematically. Physically, uh, 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 you know, what what is the point of this theory? And, and you know, as we're all familiar, at least in, when G is U one, uh, th this is the mathematical description we use for electromagnetism. So uh, here, uh, F is a two, two tensor um, who, whose co components are the electric and magnetic fields, and. Uh, Okay, so so let me uh, let me say this. Uh, okay, and then we're we're familiar with uh, the potential energy in electromagnetism. Takes this form. This is you know some electrostatic potential energy between two uh, char charges, and uh, here this E is the same E that showed up over there. So E is what we call the coupling constant, and it determines the strength of the force. So E is the coupling constant. Uh, and I've written this in such a way that uh, Q1 and Q2 are both integers. So th this is maybe a fact that's not 
taught a lot in electromagnetism courses, but uh, this is just an experimental fact. Every charge that we've ever observed in nature it has an integer multiple of the, the electron's charge. So that, that might sound incredibly bizarre, um, but, but that actually has a natural explanation in terms of gauge theory. Uh, so, so in order to explain that, let me explain what it means to have some charged uh, matter, for, like electrons, for example. So charged matter, By the way, the Euler-Lagrange equations from y the Yang-Mills uh, equations with gauge group U1 are uh, Maxwell's equations. Uh, okay, so if I have some charged matter, this is, like I said, just a section of some associated bundle. So, so this means uh, informally I can say it, I have some field in some row representation. Row is a representation. Uh, and and w we'll, we'll take row to be irreducible um, just because if we have some direct sum of, of reducible represent, sorry, if we have some direct sum of irreducible representations, we'll just call those each different fields. Um, okay, so rho is irreducible. Uh, well, what are the irreducible representations of U1? They're, they're just labeled by integers. Uh, you know, your vector maps to e to the iq theta uh, times your vector, where q is an integer. So, so uh, right away we see why charge is quantized in electromagnetism. It's because it's a U1 gauge theory, and, and you know the irreducible representations of U1 are labeled by these integers. So more generally, I can, for an arbitrary gauge group, I can have uh, matter charged under some representation. So, so you know when you hear charge, you should think uh, irreducible representation of the gauge group. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's another field that you added to your Lagrangian that's a section of some associated bundle. So, so uh, you know, an, an electron field is a section of the bundle associated to Q equals minus one. Yeah, you can have Q equals zero. That's, that's a good representation. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I'm, I'm, you know, we can have fancy nonlinear uh, actions of gauge symmetries, but um, in, in most applications we care about, they're just linear. But yeah, I mean, what, what you just hinted at is the existence of like gauged nonlinear sigma models where, where you can gauge some isometry uh, of, of, uh, of the target space. I mean, that, that is important in math, like uh, we, we can describe symplectic and hyperkähler quotients in that way, for example. Um, okay, so, so let me give uh, 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 an, uh, a cool mechanism that is both of interest to you and physicists. Uh, so this is called spontaneous symmetry breaking of gauge symmetries. In a less, in a shorter way, we just call this the Higgs mechanism. So let's say that I have, uh, or I'll start a new board. I have an SU2 gauge three. So my, my, you know, my principal bundle is a principal SU2 bundle. Uh, and furthermore, I add to this theory uh, so, some uh, matter, which is in the adjoint representation of SU2. So, so the three-dimensional representation. Okay, so let me write that down. We have omega, which is a connection on a SU2 principal bundle. And we have a field phi, which is uh, uh, you know, an element of the sec, it's a section of uh, P times adjoint representation, you know, G here is SU2 Lie algebra. Um, 
Okay, so uh, l let's suppose that for, for whatever reason, uh, m my, my gauge field, m sorry, my, my scalar field phi uh, ta takes, takes on some non-zero value. So, so th there, there are good reasons why this might happen. Uh, let me give you two. One is in supersymmetric theories, I told you that you, you can't have a potential oftentimes. A and so uh, th this field is just allowed to wander off and, and so, you know, it, it, it can take any value that it, that it wants, and so it, it's not impossible for for it to take some non-zero value. Uh, another way that, that I, I can uh, say that it has some non-zero value is I can actually force it to have some non-zero value. So I can add to my Lagrangian so, some potential, which depends on you know like trace of phi squared. And, and if if I you know I can choose my potential, so it sort of looks like this. So it forces the, the, the trace of phi squared to be non-zero at, at low energies. Yeah, sorry. Th this is uh, trace of phi squared, and this is the potential energy. Uh, so, so I can just tur add some potential to my Lagrangian that forces it to be non-zero. Uh, at low energies, but but for whatever reason, let's say that that our fi our, our field has some has some non-zero value. Well, then I can choose a gauge where it takes the following form: phi equals little phi times sigma z, where uh, little phi is positive. So it's a field from m to r plus. So so this might look funny because we're used to gauge fixing by imposing some conditions on the connection. But this is a per perfectly sensible way to fix a gauge, too. Um, physicists call this unitary gauge. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I have some, some non-zero field phi. I, I know nothing about it other than it's non-zero. I, I can, I can act, act on it by conjugation to put it in this form. Uh, the poly Z matrix, you know, the SU2 Lie algebra is the span of the poly matrices. Okay, uh, and, and similarly, I can write my connection. Uh, I'll, I'll write it in some gauge. So, you know, uh, a, a mu equals a mu x sigma x plus a mu y sigma y plus a mu z sigma z. So this is just the most general, uh, you know, element in the adjoint representation of SU2 that I can write down. Uh, and the mu is because it's a one form locally. Okay, so uh, le le let's now look at what the kinetic term uh, for, for phi looks like. So we have the gauge invariant version of the kinetic term that we had before. So. Uh, d mu phi squared. That's the, the kinetic term for phi in this Lagrangian, where here d mu is the covariant derivative. So d mu big phi equals partial mu phi plus i commutator of a mu n phi. Oops. So, so I can plug uh, th these two expressions for phi and a into this kinetic term. Yeah, so, so what, what I did is I, uh, I covered my manifold with some open sets u alpha, uh, and I chose a gauge, meaning I uh, picked some sections, uh, some local sections, s alpha from u alpha into uh, 